your film Death of Starling, I mean, it is obviously a comedy, but you've said that a lot of it is true. I mean, yeah. what were the most unbelievable tales you found that became grist to your comic? Well, we put one in uh, that, well, it was based on a graphic novel that itself was based on true events. Uh, but in the course of research, we found other true events that we put in, like Stalin's son lost the entire national ice hockey team. Um, he was in charge of them and he put them all on a plane. Uh, there was an ice storm. He was warned that, you know, the plane might go down, but he insisted. The plane went down. He lost the entire night. Uh, hockey team, too scared to tell his dad. So he just put together a scratch ice hockey team out of people he knew who were terrible. Um, and so that goes in. Um, an awful lot of it. The, the film opens with a, a, a concert that's taking place, a Mozart piano concerto being played live on Radio Moscow. Stalin rings up, asks for a copy of the recording. They put the phone down and realise they're not recording it. It's going out live. And the uh, head of Radio Moscow has to run out into the concert hall and shout for the doors to be shut and everyone to come back in off the streets and sit down and to do the concert again. Uh, otherwise, he'll be shot. And what about the, the apparatchiks running through the woods in their desperation to get to Stalin's daughter first? That didn't happen, did it? Well, no, but there was a desire to be the one who controlled the family. And, and also they had this thing that they called factionalism, which was whenever two or, pe two or three people gathered together separately to discuss things, it was known as factionalism. And if you were guilty of factionalism, you could be shot. Uh, so we wanted to play up the, uh, the kind of the play on that. I mean, it is also quite chilling, particularly, I suppose, given there's a sense that Stalin, in a way, is making a bit of a comeback in Russia. I mean, there's, you know, bus going up of him in, in Moscow. It, it's chilling to you? Well, yes. I mean, part of the reason I did it, because at the time I was thinking about doing a film about dictatorship, uh, about, you know, democracy, which I felt was fraying at the edges in, in Europe and, and, and in America now as well, especially, and also, you know, in, in modern Russia. Uh, the uh, the rise of the authoritarian, the strong figure, which is something that Putin wants to project. It's something that Trump aspires to, and and he admires strong, what he calls strong leaders in Turkey and in Russia. He's obsessed with uh, North Korea, um, and we also see in Europe elections pushing forward a whole new breed of politicians who model themselves on this strong leader role. And I think there's something rather worrying about it. So I wanted to channel that. And, you know, when the graphic novel for this film came along, I was asked to direct it. I read it and I thought, this is it. This is the perfect summation of, of what could happen now. I'll come back to the other political parallels in a minute because I definitely want to talk about that. But um, just to ask you about Russia, I mean, the film has encountered some hostility in Russia, hasn't it? I mean, the spokesperson for the Russian Communist Party called it disgusting. Another described it as a form of psychological warfare against Russia. Yeah, Are so you bothered by this? I'm not bothered. I mean, they haven't seen the film. So, <laughs> so I'd be interested to hear their critique once they've, they've had a viewing. But, you know, we have, we've got a distributor in Russia. Uh, we're hoping that it'll be shown sometime next year. Um, I'd be amazed if there wasn't a kind of comment from Russia about it. But but look, this is a this is an attempt to look at events that have been catalogued. Uh, a lot of the scenes in the film uh, uh, surrounding the actual death of Stalin were catalogued in, in his daughter's memoirs, in Khrushchev's memoirs, in, in memoirs of others at the time. Um, and, and the other thing I'd say is, the first thing I said to the producers before we'd started the film is we have to be respectful of what happened, of what happened to uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people uh, outside, across the Soviet Union at that time, the, the gulags and the, the beatings and the torture, the imprisonment. Um, we're not making fun of that. We're, we're portraying that as, as realistically as possible. Um, uh, the comedy for me really is in the comedy of hysteria as people un who've lived under this tyrannical figure start to work out how to make the next move and it's a sort of an eight person Mexican standoff because at the time you know if you were out of step if you made the wrong move you could be shot so everyone is desperate looking to everyone else to see you know, there's a story that when Stalin made a speech um, everyone stood up and applauded but the first person to stop applauding would be taken out and shot which if you think about it logically means they're still applauding um, and it's that sense of who is going to be first to break ranks
do you, in this age where everything seems to sort of escalate so quickly, particularly on social media, do you yeah. worry for yourself that you've put this film out and Russia's not happy? But it's not true to say that Russia's not happy. I mean, I did the Russian press uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, they all said they loved it. And they all <laughs> individually they said, thank God you didn't use fake Russian accents. We hate that. So, so I mean, you quoted someone from the comment. I mean, that's one person in a land of, what, 200 million people. Uh, so, so let's just wait and see what happens when we actually do uh, give it to the distributors. Politics was obviously bizarre in 1950s Russia. Pretty bizarre now in mm. America and in mm. the UK. Um, is there a sense with what you do, you've always satirised satirize politics, is what's going on now beyond satire? Well, is it beyond satire? I mean, someone like Trump as a personality, I, I think he is his own satirist, really. He's so over the top and he, you know, he distorts and he exaggerates in every tweet. The interesting thing is, I think, the, the comedians who land punches on him, I think, are the ones who are, become journalists in a way. You know, people like John Oliver and um, Seth Meyers and Samantha Bee. You know, they have a whole team of researchers and journalists analysing everything that he's said in the past, researching things that he's done in the past, uh, and things that he has said now and the contradictions within his own administration. Uh, almost they're bringing us the facts and laying them out and asking us to kind of comment on them. It's, it's interesting, comedians have almost, as Trump has undermined news by calling it fake, in that kind of false vacuum that he's created, comedians have stepped in to become journalists. Um, so I think that's an interesting sign and it's probably the, probably the most fruitful way of approaching him. Isn't there a danger though in laughing at him, in finding him such a kind of figure of fun? That mm -hmm. Don't we actually have to sort of take him deadly seriously? Well no, I'd say uh, uh, if we just portray him as a clown then that's the worst thing because then we diminish him and I think he is dangerous, I think he's unstable and I think there is a smartness to him as well. He's not an idiot, he's just deranged. Um, and, and therefore, your approach to him, if you're doing humour about him, I think is to, is to pick away at that instability rather than to portray him as a sort of cuddly clown figure. We all know clowns can be scary anyway. <laughs> do you, this side of the Atlantic, mm. do you find it a laughing matter in any way that some of um, Jeremy Corbyn's aides and followers have spoken pretty warmly about Stalin? Does that worry you? Well, I think what we're in the midst of at the moment is kind of cult politics, uh, uh, you know, and, and I thought this had disappeared with, with, I mean, when after Stalin died and Khrushchev several years later took over, he did this secret speech to the Politburo, absolutely uh, pulling apart the cult of Stalin and the cult of personality. I think there's a danger now that we, we're, we're going into that. I mean, UKIP is very much a Farage cult and it doesn't exist in any way without him. Uh, there is a danger, you know, when you take, when you do a joke on Twitter about Jeremy Corbyn or John McDonnell, that's when you get abuse. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh, and, that's, and that's interesting. I'm not saying that uh, everyone who supports Corbyn or the Labour Party is of that mindset, but I think, I think, there is a problem now because maybe of social media and the way that we only really connect now with people who agree with us. You know, if we come across a, an opinion that we disagree with, we block that person, we unfollow them. We get a lot of our news filtered now through Facebook into just the topics we want to hear about. So there is a danger, I think, that we get into a discussion where if you disagree with me, I think therefore you are wrong and therefore we shouldn't be talking. And actually, the fact that you disagree with me it means that you represent a danger to me and that you should leave because I don't feel safe. Nowhere are these divisions that you've been talking about more explicit than on Brexit. And this week you're guest editing the uh, big issue and you've got a debate on Brexit between two towering comic creations, Alan Partridge and uh, Malcolm Tucker. So what's their take? Their take, well, uh, needless to say, I mean, you must rush out and buy the big issue if you want to Tomorrow, see if it? they come to an agreement. <laughs> so all this week. Um, I mean, what I wanted to show in that and the writers uh, we were working with, show that how, how Brexit actually has broken down into these isolated arguments. I think there's a lot of frustration nationally about Brexit because I think people 
and the result of the last election demonstrated it. We kind of want, there's no main party who commands a majority of support. And the last election really told us that we would prefer everyone to sort this out together. But none of the parties are adopting that stance. You know, yet, uh, earlier this week we had John McDonald saying, Theresa May can't do it, we'll do it. Well, actually, how about you both did it? If this is the biggest crisis since the Second World War, shouldn't we be behaving like we did in the Second World War, where we had a so national no. unity, you know, or at the very least all the parties coming together to negotiate Brexit? So at the very least we'd get an agreement that we knew the bulk of the electorate would be, would be happy with. It comes to something when Alan Partridge and Malcolm Tucker are trying to sort of broker some kind of compromise deal, doesn't well, it? Well, <laughs> as I say, you have to buy it to see whether they have reached a compromise. Ah, OK. <laughs> um, just coming back to the film. Yeah. In The Death of Stalin, you've managed to find comedy in some of the worst events of the 20th century, and you've done it very successfully. I mean, the comic James Corden has, has got into a bit of hot water for uh, making a joke about Harvey Weinstein. How fine a line do you have to tread as a comic writer between finding sort of awful things funny? Well, it's to do with instinct, really. I, I don't think any subject is out of bounds, but it's just how you approach it. As I said, we went into The Death of Stalin saying we actually have to be very respectful of of what happened and be very true to what happened, which doesn't mean to say that the behaviour of people at the top wasn't hysterical and panicky and, and funny in a kind of uh, neurotic kind of way. Uh, I took my inspiration from one of Charlie Chaplin's greatest films, which was The Great Dictator, which was a comedy about Hitler made in 1941. Uh, and I mean, that's a great sort of masterclass and in, in, in how comedy, just by comedy taking on a subject, it's not belittling the subject, it's just saying let's look at this from an unexpected angle because in that unexpected approach you might find something or come across a, a, a point of view or a perspective that you wouldn't otherwise have imagined. Had you heard the rumours about Harvey Weinstein? Did you? No, I mean all my, my two films have been British and European funded so I, have, I, I know that Harvey Weinstein was trying, once In the Loop came out, he was trying to kind of persuade me to kind of meet up but I'd heard stories that he kind of interferes in the in the making of films and the editing and so on. So I told my agents that I didn't really want to go down that route. So I haven't really. I'm not. Uh, I I've heard that he was horrible, but I hadn't heard any of the you know the the the, the, the terrible stories that are coming out now. Amanda Yunchi, thank you very much. Thank you.